I am now joined with Tanu A. Akanyemi, who is an award-winning author who has written multiple books. His publishing company, The Roaring Lion, Newcastle, is also one of the sponsors of The Black Book Show. Welcome, Tanu, to The Black Book Show. Please start by giving a brief introduction about yourself. Hey, my calling. Great to be here with you again. Yeah, uh, brief, a brief intro about myself. I am Tolu A. Akiyemi, a multiple award winning author. Author that published 18 books, and I write in the genre of poetry, short stories, essays, and children's literature. Thank you very much. So, Tolu, you have the nickname The Roaring Lion of Newcastle. Why are you called the Roaring Lion of Newcastle? Yeah, so my first ever book was titled The Lions Don't Roar. And it's a collection of poems. And whenever I went to town on the local scene to perform my poetry, I would roar and also encourage, you know, the crowd to roar along with me. And, you know, I think that name just stuck along because if it, like a future event, it became more like spontaneous. When people saw me on the stage, they just begin to roar. <laughs> and it became like a very fun atmosphere. And I think in terms of my literary journey, in terms of the works I've produced over the years, I think I've truly earned that name and earned the right to be the Lion of Newcastle because my journey has been truly outstanding and and excellent. So we're now going to focus on your new book releases. In regards to your book, Awaken Your Inner Lion, what does it mean to awaken your inner lion? And tell us why is it important for people to awaken their inner lion? Yeah, I think uh, awaken your inner lion is quite important, not just, you know, for you, but, you know, for everyone out there, but it's quite important for us to like awaken the lion within because a lot of people have giant lions, tremendous gifts and talents that they're carrying, and it's just lying dormant. So, in awakening your inner lion, I lay practical examples and steps for people to, you know unleash their talent and unravel their hidden gems, which is also another of my book title, to unravel the gems within, awaken the lion within, and live your best life possible. What are some of the steps that you mentioned that someone can take to awaken their inner lion? Yeah, so uh, basically, I would let me just, uh, so this is the book, Awaken Your Inner Lion, that we're talking about. So I will just uh, give some context to some of the titles that uh, the chapters in the book. So I talked about going on a mission and, you know, being prepared. So like us having this interview, we start with preparation first and, you know, going through the rudiments and everything, then cultivating healthy relationships, you know, to... Awakening the lion within is quite important to cultivate healthy relationships. Even as a writer, as an author, I've had like relationships that have helped me on my literary journey. And you, Makone, are one of the you know good relationships, healthy relationships that I have on my on my journey. So I also wrote a chapter. Chapter three is the slippery slope, and chapter four is titled "You Need More Than Dreams." So it's just telling people that. Beyond dreaming, you need more than dreams to be able to actualize and awaken the lion within. Chapter five talks about failure, failure odds. So I, in every step of the way, we may encounter failure. In life, people encounter failure, failure all the time, but we should not let our failure in life or in our career, in our relationships define who we are. Then chapter six is titled Why Men Slept. So why men slept is encouraging the reader that you can, you know, a lot of times well, everybody just, you know, we live life normally, but we have people go the extra mile to like achieve results. Then chapter seven is living a life of inspiration. 
So for you to like inspire others, for you to make a difference in the world, it's quite important and pertinent for us to live a life of inspiration. Then chapter eight itself is awakening your inner lion and it's just encouraging people to awaken the lion within and be the best version of themselves. And chapter nine is success without cutting corners. So it's just encouraging people to like, uh, like it's still okay in the world to be able to be successful without cutting corners, without trying to like circumvent the process. So uh, you want to end the prize it's quite important that we pay the price on the journey to success. Then chapter 10 is titled, Let's Talk About Race, and 11 is titled, The Uncertainty of Life. So that's just a, that's just a brief breakdown of how we keep your inner lion, and it's encouraging people to practical steps, you know, we need to take in life to awaken the lion within, to be the best version of ourselves, and, you know, just practical life steps. On the was there a particular time in your life or something that happened to you which led you to awaken your inner lion or was awakening your inner lion a gradual process and not something that happened overnight yeah so uh, I think I already awakened my inner lion like many years ago but uh, I think what really kick started the process for me was I was this very talented writer who had been writing for a long time. I've been writing for so many years for working in the financial services sector in the UK. I didn't want people to know that, oh, this guy was just one, you know, very good writer. I was living my life on the low key. I felt like coming out as a writer would affect my life as a writer. So I didn't want my career and my writing talent to, to clash. But I just discovered that, oh, Tolu, you have this one life to live and you have to awaken this lion within. You have to, the world has to, the world has to feel the impact of your voice. You have to run. So I felt it was time for me to unravel all the gems within. And I started to take my writing seriously and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, let's go on to talk about your next book that you've released recently also. And it's called City of the Lost Memories. Please, can you give the listeners a summary of what that book's about? Yeah, City of Lost Memories explores themes of the theme of memory. And like you would also agree with me, memory is something that holds all of us together. Memory is quite important in life because people, relationships, family, everything that everything that forms the old of our human existence has to do with memory. We meet people today, they leave us, we meet people come into our life, everything, you know. So memory, City of Lost Memory, ex Memories Explore, the team of memory and, you know, so interrogating memory. So that's what the collection of poems interrogates. So as an accomplished poet and writer, what does memory mean to you from the context of your collection of poems, City of Lost Memories? Yeah, so for me, as an accomplished writer and poet, I feel like, yeah, so in my literary journey, I've met quite a lot of people on the pathway to, you know, to where I am today. And I would say different people with different, you know, different people hold, like, different, I hold different memory of different uh relationships the people have made on this journey. So I feel like having this memory, this recollection has also helped me in a way to become a better person and also to understand humans, to understand human relationships, to understand, you know, humans for what humans can be as well. So I think City of First Memory just comes from a place of examine uh, exam uh, just an examination of you know the memories either real or fictitious memories and my encounters with different people in the journey of life could you please read a poem from your book to give the listeners more insight okay let me yeah so the poem i will read is the first poem on the in the collection, and it's titled Don't. 
don't wash me away from your memory. Your knowledge of me should be masked in profundities, not faded like an eroded land. Don't color me in that paint like a victim of contorted history. My affinity with kindness should not be wiped in the A's. Don't wish your evil plans upon me. My snow white innocence is a shield to guard me from looming danger. So who is the book aimed at and why have you chosen that as your target audience? Yeah, so the the book is aimed at everybody and I think in life, as a writer who writes about the human experience, memory is quite important, not just to me, but to every one of us. Memory is a recollection of past events and it also helps us to, you know, cultivate relationships that are healthy for the future as well. So I think basically memory keeps events, people, and everything like alive in our mind. And I think that is why I wrote this collection of poems. And the, the, the collection is meant for everyone, you know, just general reading. And yeah, recommended for general reading as well. Is that to invoke happy memories or is it, or sad memories, or is it a, a mixture? Um, what kind of motive is, is there? Yeah. Yeah, so basically there are happy memories, there are sad memories, and, you know, as with life as well. So basically as a writing mentor, as a as a leader within the UK writing community as well, you, you meet a lot of, like, people as well. And you know that different people, different vibes, different people, different energies, and different people bring in different memories as well. So you have good memories, you have bad memories, and, like, I think that is what memories, anyways. We don't expect our memories of events, of people to be everything, to be all pristine and clear and good. Yeah, so for, for memory, you we always have good and bad memories of people, events, places, and you know, and general and times in life. It could be about politics, it could be anything. But I think life is all about memory. And all, not all memories of the past are good anyways. All right. We are now going to focus on your book titled On the Train to Hell, which you have also released recently. Can you tell the listeners what the book On the Train to Hell is about? The On the Train to Hell is a, is a collection of poems that explores themes of sadness and grief. And that is what... You know, we all we all are about life and death, living and dying, joy and sorrow. That is the basic of human life. And also I wrote a few political poems in the collection. And yeah, so the train to hell is just a collection of poems that are wrapped in wrap itself in the anguish of the human experience. So in regards to your book, On the Train to Hell, why did you choose to write about sadness and grief? Yeah, because sadness and grief is a commonality to us all. Today we are, you know, today we, we are here, tomorrow we are no more. We have people in our lives, we've lost people, special people to us. And, you know, I think it's part of the human experience coming to the world and people dying. And I think that's the only thing we cannot control, life and death. And I think it's very important for, for this type of work to find expression, to help people when they are grieving, to also, you know, find solace in books, in literature, and, you know, the with words that touch the core of their soul, with words that resonate as well. So please, could you read a poem from the book to give the listeners more insight? Okay.
Okay, so this one is titled Black Friday. And the sub ever Arise News Report. Over hundreds of bodies burnt. Ovier Timmy Judge. It was a Black Friday when death carnage flung our misery doors ajar. Black market engulfed in smoke plumes. Black bodies burnt. When will we learn? The skies wear mournful clouds. This pain has no name. These death numbers have been whittled in shame. This is a game, and tomorrow we will cry again. And that's Black Friday on the train to hell. Well, we're not going to go from sadness to kindness because um, we're now going to talk about your next book, which is the fourth book you've recently released. And that book is titled, If You Have To Be Anything, Be Kind. After your previous children's books, I am not a troublemaker and I wear self-confidence like a second skin. What were you looking to achieve with your latest release? If You Have To Be Anything, Be Kind. Yeah, so just to spread the message to everyone that if you have to be anything, be kind. Let's make the world a better place by spreading kindness. Let's be kind to one another in the way we relate, not just for children, even uh, for adults as well. So the way we relate, the way we build relationships, let's build relationships with the human face. You know, just everything we want to do in life, let's think about being kind, what we, the way we talk to people, the way we live with people. Let's just spread kindness. Let's, if there's anything we can do to make the world a better place, then I think it's quite imperative. So I think I, I wrote this for young children to kickstart the message from a very young age. Each. Let's spread kindness. If you have to be anything, Choose kindness. Don't choose any other thing. Just be kind. So if we if you start this message from from a young age, it will resonate with you know with young people, and it could be a mantra that will live with them forever. I had one of my very good friends who is also a writer from the north of England, and he told me he was reading it to his grand his grandson, and throughout that day the grandson if he calls the grandson say. Oh, Nana, be kind. Nana, be kind. So try that day. So I think it's a very poignant message that if you have to be anything, be kind. So when we want to overstep the mark or we are doing things to hurt others, yes, just think about kindness. How can we be kind? And I, can, I, and I think it's quite it's a very important message, not just for young people, for every one of us. Let's be kind. Let's 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 spread kindness around around us. Now, you mentioned the book is aimed at young children. What specific age group would you say that would be? Yeah, I would say specifics 4 to 8, but even 4 to 10, 4 to 11 would be fantastic. But I would just say specific 4 to 8, but even older than 8, I think they will find the message quite po poignant and very relatable as well. What, what was you like as a child when you were between 4 to 8? Was you kind? <laughs> I, 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 I was kind, but I used to get like I used to get in trouble. I used to get a lot of trouble with my dad, you know. <laughs> I, I, I was very kind, but you know, yeah, very, very kind. But I used to get into a lot of trouble on the home front. And you know, African homes, the way the way we resolve conflicts back in the days used to be quite different with, with a lot of spanking and you know, so but yeah, I was I was a, I was a good guy, introverted young boy. I had a lot of ideas, you know, to make the world a better place. Yeah, so good, good, good. Well, Tolu, you've written around 20 books and you're an award-winning author. You also have your own publishing company to help black authors. With your organization, Lilac Arts, you are you also help authors by giving them exposure through interviews and featured articles. So to aspiring writers, what would you say your literary journey epitomizes? Yeah, I think, oh yeah, the literary journey epitomizes excellence. 
it epitomizes tenacity of purpose. It also shows that it's possible. So when you look at it and you are looking at starting out and you feel like, oh, I can't do this. This is not possible. And when you just think about this random guy who published his first book, his first collection of poems over five years ago and who has gone on to accomplish this much success, then I think it's quite inspiring, not just for me as a writer who has accomplished this much, but even for others who are looking to achieve this, this kind of success on their, on their writing journey, that if Tolua Kiyemi can do this, not just in writing, in whatever field you are talented in and you want to explore, that you feel like, oh, if this guy can do this, then there's nothing stopping me. So I, I hope my story inspires hope in people. I hope it helps people to bridge for their dreams, to unravel their hidden gems, like the title of my collection of essays, to awaken their inner lion when they feel distressed or they feel like there's no direction. I hope my journey inspires people also to awaken their inner lion like I have done. And I hope we have many lions of like, I am the lion of Newcastle. I hope we have many lions around Lion of Kent, Lion of London, Lion of Peterborough, Lion of Blue, Lion of, Lion of Lagos, and all of that here. So I think it's quite important, but I know, I hope my journey inspires hope and belief. What's the importance of mentoring to the next generation of writers? And what do you think aspiring writers can do better in relationships building with their mentors? Yeah, I think mentoring is quite important, not just for us writers, but in every facet of human life, of human endeavor. We need the right mentors to people who have done, you know, the things that we aim to do, people who have, you know, they've achieved phenomenal, phenomenal results. And, you know, so just even as a writer, as, you know, in life generally, we have people who have achieved outstanding results that we also aspire for. So I think mentoring is quite significant for people who are looking up to achieve outstanding results. It makes the journey and the process much more easier and clear cut for us in terms of looking for a direction. So if someone who is looking to start out to become a writer and you say, well, this guy who's done this before, how did he do it? How did he make it happen? And I think the lessons on the journey can also help upcoming writers, upcoming talents in whatever field of endeavor to avoid the mistakes people like myself not made in our own individual journey. So I think it's quite important that like for aspiring writers or for people generally to see the role of mentoring in life, how our mentors can help reduce our own travel time. So if you have a mentor who has achieved safe with a, an experienced driver, you're learning to drive, that you know that journey that might have taken you say like 50 hours to learn how to drive, you might just reduce to 20 hours because you have someone who is willing to tutor you, to guide you, to become, you know, to become the best version of yourself. I also think for aspiring writers, you must be willing to like invest, invest, invest. Don't just uh, I see don't don't just look at like getting from people. Look at what can I put in into the process. I have like a few examples of. I remember a few years ago I had one of my former bosses who approached me to say, "Oh, Tolu, can you help me mentor my daughter to like she wants to start on out on a writing journey and everything." I said, "Oh yeah, that's fine, but uh, I think it will be beneficial for." you to buy some of my books for her to read because uh, someone that you want to mentor your daughter, if it's based off of my writing journey and my writing success, then at least I think it will, prof it will be very good for your daughter to know, oh, this is his writing style, is what, so it must be about, it must be about the writing, about what you are looking to gain from that person. So, so at that point, I, when I say, oh, go and get the books, I never head back from from the person. So it goes to show that people just want to take off you as a mentor. People just want to benefit from you. But that intuitiveness, that wisdom to say, oh, this 
person that wants to mentor me through this journey, how can work? I can't, maybe I can't pay him for this service. I can't do ABCD for this person, but how can I support? How can I support? How can I invest in whatever they are doing? So I see this generation, mainly they want to benefit from people who have talent. They want to benefit from mentors, leaders within the industry, but they are not willing to like pay the price. They are not willing to invest. People want to just use you. They want to just come and use you, get what they can benefit from you and leverage off your goodwill, lef leverage off everything you've built, but they're not willing to like, you know, support. So I think it's something that I think leaders within, maybe not just the writing community as well, maybe just generally you will see, you meet a lot of people that want to just benefit from you. They want to use you. They just want to <laughs> take things off you, but they're not willing to like, oh, when you're ever doing something, like, oh, how can we support? How can we turn up? How can we, because there are so many things you can do to support people in your community as well. Not just by in, in cash, but in kind, in, in kind supporting whatever project they are involved in and all of that. So I think it's, it's, a, it's more of a deficit in this generation whereby people just want to like benefit from mentors, benefit from leaders within, it could be music artist or whatever. People want to leverage off your goodwill. They want a future, they want a collaboration but they don't want to just these simple things to like, oh, this mentor, what can we do? You want someone to be your mentor, but how many of his books have you read? The other day on my book launch, I met like a complete total stranger who told me, I've never I met him for the first time. I said, I've read all your books. I was shocked. He was an elderly man and he was like, I have read all your books. I was like, wow. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about. I have People like, uh, uh, when I go to Time and Market, people that buy a book, they come to the next time, they buy two books, they buy three books, they buy four books. That's, you know, that's fan loyalty. That's people who treasure your work. And these are people that they do not even know you. But they, you know, they, they believe your literary ability. And meanwhile, we have others as well who we just want to keep taking and taking away from you. So I think for us leaders within the industry, it's a bit like, when you have people just taking, taking it there, I guess your points are just tired. They are tired. Like, they are, I, I, I think maybe not just for myself, but I think it happens time and again whereby when people just draw away from you, then you just become weak. It's just like you're giving blood, donating blood, and nobody's replenishing that blood back. It becomes really tiresome. So, so I think it's quite important for young people in this generation to understand that mentoring is not just about collecting, collecting, and collecting. What can you give back? What can you what can you also give? People just want to take away from you, take away from you. But if it's their uh, turn to do anything of value, they they also still want to collect from you. They want to they want to keep collecting. So I think it's a, a, a kind of deficit in this generation. People have to always like, how can we support the mentors to what can we give to it doesn't have to be money, but how can we support whatever endeavor they are involved in as well? Well, we're coming to an end of this interview. So before we go, um, can you please give us your final comments, any final comments you've got? Uh, remind the listeners again the title of your books and let them know where those books can be purchased and you know where people can keep in touch with you. Yeah, oh, thank you, my Conan. It's been a great interview. Final comments. Yeah, so uh, like I said before, it's pertinent for us to... You know, awaken the lion within, unravel the hidden gems. Don't sit on the fence. We all have talent. I have people say say to me, "Oh, I don't have any talent." That's a lie. There's something special you can do. There's a talent you have. There's something extraordinary that you have been made to do. You've not just come to the world to be a passenger, to be a passerby. It it doesn't have to be writing. It can be anything. Just think about what you can do differently. Make use of your talent. If you have to be anything, be kind. Be kind, not just to your immediate environment, but you know, just to the world. It makes the world less toxic. Yes, yeah, so I'll say that. It's where you can connect with me, I'm on on the socials, Instagram and Twitter at Tolu Toludo. Also on Twitter at Tolu Akiemi. I'm on Facebook at Tolu A Akiemi as well. 
and my website is tolutoludo.com. My author's blog, toluakiemi.com. My publisher's imprint, the Rory Lion Newcastle.com. My literary imprint, which I'm a co founder of, Lion and Lilac.org. I'm also the founder of the Newcastle Review.org. Like my colleague has said, I have published 18 books, two books forthcoming, and I have two dusty manuscripts as well. So you can check my Amazon page out at Tolu A. Akiyemi. All my books are available on Amazon. Dead Lionstone Row, Collection of Poems, Dead Dogs Don't Back, and Dead Dogs Don't Back, and Don't Buy, or so Ravio Indian James. So just all the books, just check me out on, you know, I'm on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble, on Google Play, on tolutoludo.com, on the Royal Lion, Castle.com, the Roving Light, or Color Books, everywhere where books are sold. Rah! Okay, Tulu. Now, I know you said that a bit fast, and for your for listeners that haven't quite picked up on that, what I want to do now is if you could just uh, repeat your the uh, your website, tell us the, the, the books that we've spoken about on this show, the four new book releases, say the, what those books are titled, and then repeat your website. When you say your website, um, say how it's spelled as well, just so that people can pick up on that. Okay, yeah, so the, the latest releases are... Uh... Awaken Your Inner Lion, a collection of essays by the great lion of Newcastle. So that's Awaken Your Inner Lion, a collection of essays. On the Train to Hell, a collection of poems on sadness and grief. And if you've, if you've lost anyone or you know anyone who is going through loss and grief, this would be a lovely, nice present to them. So... Or the train to uh, a collection of points on sadness and grief. City City of Lost Memories, it inter it interrogates memory, and because memory keeps people and events alive in our minds. Yeah, so that is what City of Lost Memories explores, and it's a collection of poems as well. City of Lost Memories. And this is my her children's picture book and it's titled If You Have to Be Anything, Be Kind. So this message is very important for young people in our lives, even for we older ones as well. Kindness is a very poignant and important message that we need to always talk about. So this is If You Have to Be Anything, Be Kind. And my books are available to, my books are available on Amazon.com. But uh, no, my books are available on all Amazon marketplaces, not just .com, available on Barnes and Noble, available on tolutolu.com, available on Google Play, available on Tolu, on the Rural Lion Newcastle.com, and my website is tolutoludo.com, T O L U T O L U D O.com, and the Roaring Lion Newcastle. Dot com the roaring lion newcastle.com thank you very much thank you very much it's been another wonderful interview on the black book show this has been McConnell and Sanko for speaking with Tolu A. Akanyami the roaring lion of Newcastle Rawr.